Tonight, Canada's premiers demand more health care money from Ottawa. It's past time for the federal government to stop quibbling. While Canadians share their urgent care horror stories and some emergency rooms are busier than ever. To me, the emergency department is for emergencies. New revelations about Donald Trump's influence on the January 6th riot before and since. The president you know, got everybody riled up, told everybody to head on down. And the international effort to bring home intergalactic images. Seeing this, uh, this, I mean, it's all that we've been working for. The James Webb Space Telescope beams back beauty and fodder for researchers around the world. Tonight, the Canadian connection and Bob breaks down what he sees among the stars. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. From the front lines of healthcare, the doctor's offices and the waiting rooms, right into the premier's offices, frustration is running high right now. The system is faltering and everyone is pushing for a fix. Today, Canada's premiers wrapped up their two-day meeting by pressing again and again for a meeting with the prime minister. They want more healthcare funding, patients faced with long wait times and ER closures, just want more healthcare. Both points were on full display in Victoria today, where the premiers met. But as David Cochran shows us, someone who wasn't there got a lot of attention too. We want doctors! Outside the premiers' meeting, frustration over a lack of access to health care. Inside, frustration over a lack of access to the prime minister. It's past time for the federal government to stop quibbling, to stop saying that we don't have a problem. Growing anger fueled by this blunt dismissal. So their 22% figure isn't real. In a Monday interview with Power and Politics, the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs accused the premiers of lowballing the federal share of health spending and complaining about a lack of cash while running surpluses or sending rebates to voters. The federal spending to support public health care is about a third of all the spending. They use this fake figure of 22%. What's not fake is the fact that the Canadian health care system is in crisis. Newfoundland and Labrador Premier Andrew Fury is also a surgeon who has led international relief missions and still works part-time in a St. John's hospital. It's not fake when I have to go in and tell a patient they can't have surgery. That's not fake. If they want to go on, uh, on a talk show and complain about us, that's fine but uh, no one will thank them for that. We indeed want to avoid entering into a sterile debate uh, about numbers. This time it was the federal health minister on the talk show saying health ministers needed to do more work before first ministers can meet. We want to see what type of results we want to achieve together before we speak of the dollars. We have a diverse group. Of Not the response they wanted after months of waiting. Eight months later, we're exchanging notes uh, through the media. I, I, you know, where'd the love go? I don't understand why Mr. Trudeau doesn't want to meet us. And it's a bit insulting to send Mr. Leblanc or Mr. Duclos answering our request. Okay, so David, uh, no meeting, no money. Where does this all go from here? Yeah, so Andrew, in their private meetings, the premiers were talking about ways they can escalate this fight. And what sources are telling me is that they're planning a national advertising campaign, one that spells out the precise medical and health services that patients could lose if the provinces don't get this money they're looking for from Ottawa. So that federal provincial unity, Andrew, that we saw during the pandemic, that is clearly starting to unravel, and it's happening fast. David Cochran, thank you very much. Thank you. Staffing shortages, burnout, COVID outbreaks. Canadians are seeing the effects of it all in emergency care right now. With clinics and ERs sometimes being so strapped, they have to close. When you see open today and could be closed tomorrow, it, it's, it's alarming. And in Bonavista, Newfoundland and Labrador, you actually can see that. The health authority put in this new sign as it struggles with a doctor shortage. The hospital here has always been 24 seven ever since I couldn't remember. The next ER in a medical emergency, an hour and a half away. It's a scenario on repeat. The emergency department in Clearwater, BC just had a two-day closure. The ER in Perth, Ontario has been closed for more than a week. And this urgent care center in Brampton, Ontario was forced to close early on Sunday. The list goes on. Now in Ontario, new wait time numbers are shining a harsh light on the plight of emergency rooms that are open. Here's Mike Crawley with why some say family doctors are connected to the problem. 
Sharon Minnell recently developed a severe sinus infection. Instead of being able to go in to see my doctor, I got a phone appointment. Her doctor prescribed an antibiotic, but the condition worsened and she tried again to see the doctor. I got an email back saying they recommended I go to emergency rather than coming in to see him. To me, the emergency department is for emergencies. And they are under pressure. New numbers show in May, Ontario's ERs were as crowded as they've ever been. The average wait for a first assessment by a doctor at a record high. And patients who got admitted spent on average more than 20 hours in the ER waiting for a hospital bed, tying the record set during January's Omicron wave. By May, Ontario's COVID cases were at a lull, but hospitals were struggling with patients whose care had been delayed. What we're seeing now is really the presentation of illnesses that at times um, you know, are, are increasingly complex, maybe things that um, have you know, been left uh, for months and sometimes years. Some say family doctors are also driving the ER backlogs by not seeing patients in person. Obviously, it's a problem if patients are not able to get in to see their family doctors in person in a timely way. We are but this researcher says it doesn't play a major role. And we found no relationship that suggests that more virtual care use increases emergency department use. What is proven to cause more ER visits? not having a family doctor at all. Your family doctor is the beginning, uh, the middle and the end of your whole healthcare journey. So if you don't have that entryway, uh, you're gonna end up in the eMERGE. Before the pandemic, more than 1.3 million Ontarians did not have a family doctor. There are no official updates to that figure, but with more doctors leaving family medicine than joining it, the number can only be getting bigger. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Ontarians can expect an update from their chief public health officer tomorrow about expanding access to fourth doses or second booster shots. Right now, the second booster is available to those 60 and older and Indigenous people over 18. No word yet on who may be newly eligible tomorrow. But provinces have taken a piecemeal approach to expanding access. In Quebec, people ages 18 and older can already make an appointment online for their fourth doses. And B.C. is making plans to offer everyone 12 and up a booster shot in the fall. Okay, let's turn to the United States, where a dramatic day of testimony revealed close connections between those who invaded the Capitol on January 6th and former President Donald Trump. And as Susan Ormiston shows us, lawmakers now suggest his influence may not have stopped then. You know, the president you know, got everybody riled up. Hold everybody head on down. Stephen Ayers, a cabinet maker who in 2020 hung on every word Trump said. He leapt at the chance to go to D.C. on January 6th because Trump invited him. I mean, I was already worked up and so were most of the people there. So as you started marching, did you think there was still a chance the election would be overturned? Yeah, at that time I did. Today for the sake of our democracy. But Trump's lies about a stolen election cost Ayers his job, his house, swept up in the crowd breaching the Capitol. He was charged and now feels duped. I consider myself a family man and I love my country. Um, I don't think any one man is bigger than either one of those. For me, I felt like I had, uh, you know, like horse blinders on. I was, I was locked in the whole time. This hearing attempting to directly link Donald Trump to the violence, how he ignored even his White House lawyer who was unconvinced of a stolen election. If your question is, did I believe he should concede the election, at a point in time, yes, I did. After a wild West Wing meeting in December with advisors and lawyers screaming at each other. Donald Trump issued a tweet that would galvanize his followers, unleash a political firestorm, and change the course of our history as a country. Raskin said Trump knew exactly what he was doing. Calling for a big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there, will be wild. The response, immediate. He has specifically called on his supporters to arrive in D.C. If you have enough people you can push down any kind of a fence or a wall. There's going to be a red wedding going down January 6th. Extremist militia groups like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys took Trump's tweet as a call to arm up and organize. American carnage. That's Donald Trump's true legacy. 
Okay, so Susan, today they tried to link Trump to these groups' actions on January 6th, and now their suggestion he's been trying to exert influence since. Yeah, right at the end of the day, Liz Cheney, the vice chair, a Republican, dropped a warning to Donald Trump saying they have information he's tried to contact one of their witnesses. The Department of Justice has been made aware, and she says we take witness tampering very seriously. You know, we expected these hearings to be wrapped by now, and they would be writing a report, but it appears every witness that comes forward, they get more leads, so we do expect at least one more hearing next week. Okay, Susan Ormiston in Washington, thank you. There is some new video from Uvalde, Texas tonight showing the moments inside Robb Elementary School after the gunman arrived. The Uvalde police force is under intense criticism for its response to the tragedy. Tonight, a four minute excerpt showing some of that response has been published by an Austin newspaper, The American Statesman. We are not gonna show the gunman running through the halls, but we'll pick it up three minutes after that, when the first police officers run in after him. Officers follow the gunman towards the classrooms where 19 children and two adults died. About a minute later, officers retreat as shots are fired. They regroup at the end of the hall. Nearly 20 minutes after the gunman runs in, more heavily armed officers begin to arrive. 28 more minutes pass and some officers move down the hall after more gunfire goes off. Nearly an hour after the gunman enters the school, the video shows one officer sanitizing his hands. Multiple students have called 911 at this point, pleading to be rescued. 77 minutes after the gunman's arrival, officers breach the classroom and kill the shooter. Well, huge crowds lined the streets of Tokyo to say farewell to Japan's former Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe. A hearse carried his body out of the temple where a private funeral service was held. That was followed by a procession through the city. Japan's longest serving prime minister was assassinated last Friday while making a speech. A 41-year-old man was arrested at the scene. In Nova Scotia today, the inquiry into Canada's worst modern mass shooting remained focused on the gunman. New documents reveal a long history of violent encounters before his deadly 2020 rampage. Kayla Hounsell has the details and a warning. They are disturbing. The remains of Gabriel Wortman's home after he set it on fire. Brenda Forbes was his neighbor. He was scary and I thought, I, I can't live here anymore. She testified she sold her home and moved across the country in 2014. And then... Well, the people that bought it, he killed. And he burnt the house down. Forbes wasn't the only one afraid of Wortman. The Mass Casualty Commission heard dozens of accounts of Wortman being physically, sexually, and verbally abusive, including toward patients at his denture clinic. A number of witnesses, including the perpetrator's father, described this behavior of violently removing dentures from people's mouths if they owed him money or had complained about his work. At least eight patients reported his behavior to the Denturist Licensing Board of Nova Scotia. Wortman tried to dismiss the complaints as a witch hunt, but eventually signed a settlement agreement. He was known for having lower prices than other denturists and for accepting cash. One witness, identified only as E.E., e., told the commission Wortman targeted low-income female patients for sexual encounters, manipulating them with alcohol and nice meals. She said she lived in a house without running water, and the gunman was like a miracle for her. She said they had a consensual, sexual, but not romantic, relationship. Wortman's partner, Lisa Banfield, was afraid of him, according to Forbes. She was scared, really scared. Forbes said she witnessed him aggressively controlling Banfield and that Wortman's uncle told her Wortman had pinned Banfield to the ground and beaten her. I was afraid she was going to get killed and he, I knew he was dangerous so I reported this. Forbes said the RCMP told her they couldn't do anything without a direct witness. On Friday, the commission will hear from Lisa Banfield. It will be the first time she speaks publicly since the tragedy took place. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, Canada's telecoms regulator is demanding answers from Rogers after the company's massive service outage last week. Rafi Bujikanyan reports on the CRTC's new request, plus what Rogers is now saying about compensation for customers. 
Days after millions of Canadians were cut off from their phones and the internet, the country's telecommunications regulator has a message for Rogers. It says last week's events jeopardized the safety of millions and called them unacceptable, demanding details about what went wrong, setting a 10-day deadline. Well, it's going to come down to when we actually get to see the answers. Are those answers um, exactly the type of responses that we were that we we're looking for? After days of complaints, Rogers says customers will receive credit for five days of lost service instead of the two it initially proposed, amid calls for clear compensation plans for next time. Should the telecommunications company for outages look more like, when it comes to compensation, look more like the airline industry with some sort of bill of rights for users? I think these are all things that need to be discussed. When his internet was knocked out, small business owner Neil Brody says he couldn't answer client emails for days. With our industry, we're constantly in contact not only with the clients to give them updates on how their particular projects are going, but also with the suppliers, and we were not able to contact anybody as a result of this. Yesterday, the industry minister pushed the country's major telecom companies to come to an agreement on emergency backup plans, should one of them go down again. It's an easy fix that we should have a backup network, something that actually can cater to the day-to-day -day, day needs. Like, we shouldn't have to face this. So we know these things can happen. How come we, we have not, uh, we are not well prepared for it? The CRTC is asking lots of questions to Rogers, including what caused the outage and how many people could not call 911 and for how long. The regulator also says it's considering a public inquiry. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. NASA has unveiled its first set of full-color images from the groundbreaking James Webb Telescope. And what was beamed back from outer space has left astronomers stunned. Never before has the world seen these kinds of views of the cosmos. From the detail in this striking scene in our Milky Way to images of other galaxies millions of light years away. Jayla Bernstein explains why scientists are so excited about what the telescope can do and what the Canadians involved hope to see next. And lift off. Seven months after the James Webb Space Telescope launched, people gathered to watch in India, Israel, and at the Canadian Space Agency near Montreal to see the deepest, most detailed colour images of the universe ever captured. We can see possibilities no one has ever seen before. The Webb's predecessor, the Hubble, once captured this deep field image of a galaxy cluster. This is what the James Webb Space Telescope observed. A closer look shows the layers of detail. Red specks in the background are distant galaxies from more than 13 billion years ago. Also released, this display of gas and dust expelled from a dying star. This is what the Hubble was able to capture before. Not just pretty pictures, scientists say embedded in these images is a wealth of data. That data, you know, it dropped when they, when they were revealed and there are people who have it on their computers right now who are looking at it. I am positive, I know some of them. They'll probably be the first research papers submitted in days and then it's just going to keep rolling out. This is how we saw the Carina Nebula before now. James Webb reveals a textured landscape with hundreds of new stars. And these five galaxies, known as Stefan's Quintet, suddenly come into sharp focus with Webb's technology. This group of galaxies has a lot going on. Two of those galaxies are smashing into each other. So you have a giant cosmic shock wave. And, and it, you can really just see how it glows. Another discovery, a distant planet, WASP-96b, has evidence of water vapor. That observation is thanks to one of the Canadian-built instruments on board the telescope. Called NEARIS, the device helps the telescope see infrared light. It's fabulous. It's fabulous to see finally that spectrum of a, an exoplanet. Uh, seeing this, uh, this, I mean, it's all that we've been working for. For those Canadians who've devoted years of their lives to building web, they hope their work will answer some of humanity's biggest questions. We're turning the page. On, on, uh, on new chapters on, on, in astrophysics on every field, the early universe, the exoplanet atmospheres, the star formation processes, how galaxies evolve, and even things that we don't even know yet. 
Okay, so uh, Jayla, as far as that next chapter goes, what, what can we expect next? I mean, what sorts of discoveries can we anticipate? Well, this is the thing I've been asking scientists is, is what can we expect to see from Webb going forward? And they say, look, we really don't know what the biggest discoveries are going to be because we just really can't anticipate what this telescope is going to discover in the universe. But of course, there are some big things that they're looking for. One of the things they're keeping an eye out for, one of the big things, is the potential for distant planets that could be habitable. So they're going to be keeping an eye out in future research for things like signs of water, uh, signs of habitable temperatures. Lots to discover. Jayla Bernstein in Montreal, thank you so much. Okay, coming up, we'll take a closer look at what's going on in those beautiful new images of the cosmos. You will see that two galaxies are actually touching yeah. each other. Yeah, like almost. Uh... And this is a galaxy merging. This is what galaxies do. Bob McDonald and I do a little stargazing a little later. Plus, a stunning revelation from one of the UK's most celebrated Olympians. And she said, if you ever want to see your family again, don't say anything. If you say anything, they will take you away. Up next, Mo Farah's secret life as the victim of child trafficking. And a little later. As chaos and unrest grip Sri Lanka, Sri Lankans in Canada share their thoughts and feelings and what they'd like to see happen next. We're back in two. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. One of Britain's most popular Olympic distance runners has revealed a painful part of his past. As Chris Brown shows us, it's come as a major shock, but he's speaking out for a reason. And Mo Farah's got the double! He's the Olympic champion again! In the world of track, Mo Farah has no equals. With four Olympic gold medals and a slew of world championships, he's the world's most successful long-distance runner ever. Most people know me as Mo Farah, but it's not my name or it's not the reality. Which is why his revelation in an upcoming documentary has shaken his legion of UK fans. Farah says he didn't come to Britain as a Somali refugee like he's always told people. Instead, he was illegally trafficked here as a nine-year-old and enslaved by a woman who ripped up the paper with the contacts for his family. And she said, if you ever want to see your family again, don't say anything. If you say anything, they will take you away. In the documentary, Farah claims his real name is Hussein Abdi Kahin, and he took the false name that was on the documents that got him into the UK. To come Olympic champion four times, it means so much. Farah's incredible successes and humble beginnings have made him one of Britain's most beloved athletes. And now anti-slavery advocates are saying he's also one of its most courageous. His story just highlights the fact that anybody can be caught up in a situation of human trafficking and no one is immune. Farah's real mother never stopped looking for him and tracked him down after he became famous. <laughs> But that moment was just to know that your mom's okay and she's alive. Everyone's okay. It's Mo Farah takes gold for Great Britain. Farah says he's telling his remarkable story now to try to change perceptions about modern slavery. Often people who use fake names are kicked out of Britain, but the Home Office has told the BBC since Farah was a child when this happened, he won't face any consequences. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Well, student film recently shown in Toronto has whipped up a storm online. It's all about an image some say causes religious offence. Police in India are even investigating the filmmaker. She's a student and activist from there, and she tells Lisa Shing that politics are driving much of the response. In her movie short, Lina Mani Makli plays herself, a film student in Toronto, but possessed by the Hindu goddess Kali. It is my tribute to Kali. And for that few hours, I was Kali. The spirit was in me. That's what I believe in. And this whole piece is my meditative piece on multiculturalism in Canada. 
But that wasn't the message received by some who've seen a poster image Mani Makele tweeted out. It depicts the goddess Kali smoking a cigarette and waving a pride flag. It provoked some furious responses online as the image was seen by many to be offensive and disrespectful. We've decided not to show it. Any artist would expect a discussion, a discourse post her work being exhibited. But I never thought, you know, I would be attacked by this kind of organized violence. Mani Makele, who is Hindu herself, says she has received thousands of hateful messages calling for violence against her and her family. Twitter India took down her tweet. Lawyers filed complaints with the police who have now opened cases against her. Politicians in India have weighed in. This Canadian MP2 calling it painful. Supporters say she has every right to her artistic freedom, while critics argue the director's portrayal of Kali disrespects a sacred figure. Now, all of this is playing out against an incredibly polarized political climate in India. There seems to be an attempt to create a version, a hegemonic version of Hinduism. And anybody who, who sort of, you know, shifts away from that script is immediately termed as either anti-Hindu or anti-national. In Canada, the Aga Khan Museum said it deeply regrets a video that inadvertently caused offence and no longer streams it on its site. This is really overwhelming. It's really hard to process. And will you continue making films, making art? I will die if I don't make films that I believe in. And I will die if I can't defend my films. But first, she has to fight her many legal battles over this film. Until then, she says it won't be safe for her to return home to India. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. Well, images unveiled from the James Webb Space Telescope are giving us a glimpse of space like we've never seen before. This one freaks me out a little, can I just say? Because <laughs> yeah. it looks like, like an alien ultrasound. <laughs> In my defense, it did. Coming up, Bob McDonald helps me understand these strangely beautiful images. Plus, a little later. A Canadian with a unique talent on the verge of a new world record. So NASA did indeed release new images today from the world's most powerful telescope, a stunning snapshot showing cosmic cliffs and glittering landscapes. They reveal the deepest view of the universe humans have ever seen. Now we wanted to take a closer look at the photos with someone who's been making sense of science for decades. So I called up the host of CBC Radio's Quirks and Quarks earlier today, and here's what Bob McDonald saw that I did not. Hi, Bob. How's it going? Hi, Andrew. Great to see you. Can I just say I'm super excited to be able to like to just geek out with you on all of this stuff. <laughs> I've got some of the images right here uh, on my tablet and, and you're going to walk me through what I'm seeing, because when I look at this, okay. I just see a lot of lights and it's very pretty. But but like, what, first of all, what am I looking at here in this picture? Is it like stars or galaxies okay. or something else? Every dot in this picture is a galaxy. Not stars. So this is very, very far away. These are called deep field images. And it's a really neat trick that they do. They pick a piece of sky that is black, that other telescopes don't see anything. And it's a very, very tiny little piece of sky. And they just open the, the shutter on the camera for hours and hours. Like how, like how far away am I looking or, or how long ago? Like, that, like that's the kind of the weird question, right? Yeah. Because space and time, when you're looking at these kind of photos, can really mess with your head. Yes, it can, because telescopes are time machines. The farther out you look, the farther back in time you see, because it takes light time to reach us. And this is 13.5 billion years. The universe is only 13.8 billion years. So we're pretty far back. But there's another interesting effect that's happening in this picture. If you zoom into those white blobs in the center there, yep. those are galaxies that are in the foreground. They're, they're close to us. And... It's a three-dimensional picture, so the little red fuzzy blobs are in the background. But if you look around a bit, you'll see that some of the fuzzy blobs are arcs. Just go, yeah, just go in a little bit there, and you'll see that they're curves. Zoom in right there. Yeah, like and almost like I'm looking at like Those arcs are actually circles. distorted light. Yeah. yeah. 
That's, that's called gravitational lensing. And it's the gravity of those galaxies in the foreground that have bent light and act like a lens to amplify the light of galaxies that are way, way far behind. And the whole point is to put together the story of the evolution of the universe. We're seeing almost back to the Big Bang. So it's kind of like putting together a movie from the very beginning. We know how it ends because that's where we are now, but we, we don't know how it started. <laughs> and Webb is going to really continue to do this much, much deeper than Hubble. Okay, what's the next photo that I need to look at? It's called the uh, Stefan's Quintet, and it's a series of galaxies, a group of galaxies that are stuck together by their own gravity. And again, zoom into the, the ones right in the middle there, and you will see that two galaxies are actually touching yeah. each other. Yeah, like almost. Uh, and this is a galaxy merging. This is what galaxies do. Is that a good thing or a bad thing that they're merging? <laughs> This is, well, it's sort of what they do. They start out as these beautiful spirals, then they turn up looking like footballs when they all merge. But this is going to happen to us because we are also part of a group like this. And we have a neighbor called the Andromeda Galaxy, which is just a bit bigger than our Milky Way, and it's heading towards us. And in a few hundred million years or so, we're going to look like that. Our two galaxies are going to be together. So for people in the future, they're going to look up into the night sky and we'll have two Milky Ways. We'll have our own. And then we'll have another one like that. There'll be like a big X in the sky as these two galaxies come together. Okay, you've already blown my mind, Bob, uh, but there are more photos <laughs> to go through. Yeah, there's a Canadian image here that I want to talk about because Canada is one of the three partners in the uh, Webb Space Telescope. And this image, it may not look as spectacular as the pictures of all the galaxies. It's just a graph. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at here is the atmosphere of a planet going around a distant star. And each one of those peaks, those those tops of the waves, is water. The so wait, wait, wait. So, so what does that mean? We're looking at one planet with water or signs of water, and right. therefore we can conclude what? Well, we can't conclude anything. I know where you're going, Andrew. You're <laughs> going to say, oh, therefore there must be life on it, right? Sure. sure. <laughs> and that we would like to think that. Unfortunately, this particular planet uh, is very, very close to its star, and it's very, very hot. Part of the Canadian contribution to the Webb Telescope is to look at all kinds of these planets and study their atmospheres to try to find one that's more like the Earth. That's the holy grail is to find another Earth out there. We have not found one yet, and Canada may be the country to do it through the Webb Telescope. Okay. Bob, what's next? Carina Cliffs is where stars are being born. Oh, this so this actually this looks is, like, a, like a mountain, like cliff sides kind of. It does. It does. And it's actually a, a huge cloud of gas within our own Milky Way. So we're getting closer and closer here as we, we look at these pictures. And this is an enormous cloud of gas and dust. And it's where stars are being born. We came from one of these. I look at this and it looks like like mountainsides, right? It could be any, any peak right. on Earth that we're seeing. But this is, I mean, <laughs> a little bigger. Yeah. Many thousands of light years across. I mean, this is uh, this is a huge, huge cloud. One of those little blobs, like uh, yeah, just there at the upper yeah. left, that that thing that's sticking up there looks like a thumb. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's that's bigger than our whole solar system. Wow. So from here to Pluto would fit within that. Okay, so what, what's this last one here? This, can, <laughs> this this one freaks me out a little. Can I just <laughs> well, say because it looks like like an alien ultrasound like a you know like, like a kind of like like no, extraterrestrial embryo am i wrong yeah. yeah. Well, it is, except it's the opposite of an embryo. It's it's how a star dies. So we just saw an area where stars are being born. This is called the Southern Ring. And this is what our sun is going to look like in another four or five billion years. When some stars die, they blow off their outer layers of gas. And that forms this ring around that we see here. And we're seeing it again. And if you go into this particular picture, go really, really in as tight yeah. as you can, yeah, you you'll see that it's actually two stars. It's a binary. Yeah. And they hadn't seen that before. That's new. So we've got two stars here. One of them died. The other one's still going around it. And so we're putting together the life and death of stars as well. So there's still a lot to go. There's a lot about the universe we still don't know. Well, either. if there's anything I've learned from you over the years, Bob, it's that the next surprise is always just around the corner. So thank you so, you thank you so much for walking <laughs> me through this. This is great. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Andrew. <laughs> I do learn uh, so much every time I speak with Bob McDonald, and I hope you did too. That, that was a lot of fun. Okay, uh, still to come, there are reports tonight that Sri Lanka's president has now fled the country in the aftermath of dramatic political unrest. I wholeheartedly support this protest because it, um, it's people's protest. Coming up, Sri Lankans in Canada weigh in on the chaos back home.
Welcome back. Sri Lanka's beleaguered president has reportedly fled the country after weeks of protests that peaked this past weekend when thousands stormed the presidential palace. Protesters who took over the entire compound have refused to leave the palace or the occupied prime minister's residence until both officially resign as promised. Protesters blame them for the economic meltdown, the worst in seven decades, now causing critical shortages of everything from food to gas. Now, Canada's sizable Sri Lankan population has been watching all of this very closely. We asked some of them what they think of the protest movement and what they'd like to see happen. My name is Toshale Ratnayaka and uh, I'm a PhD student fourth year at University of New Brunswick and I came to Canada in 2016 and the last time I visited Sri Lanka in 2018. I wholeheartedly support this protest it's because it's, um, it's people's protest. It's not politically motivated and the people are the ones who are in the street and the people are fighting in social media as well as in the street and saying that this government should step down and then uh, give the opportunity to new visionary leadership to steer the country. So five days we have to wait for the queue, but they are giving 1,500 rupees for the bikes. That means three liters. Three liters not enough for us. Hi, my name is Shanali Kulupuarachi and I'm from Sri Lanka. I'm an international student currently studying at the University of Manitoba. Um, the last time I went back home was in 2020 during COVID. I'm here because uh, we have to explore what, what uh, this is our tax money. So I'm here because we have to explore what kind of things they done for our tax money. My family has been safe, but um, of course they have been deprived of um, basic necessities once again. They don't have access and um, people have uh, lost jobs from what I've heard. Also, my parents run a business, so we, it hasn't been performing well in the recent past. So things have been pretty bad on that end for almost everyone back home. Um, but so far they've been safe. Um, they have been participating in protests as well. A lot of my people have been suffering for so many days and all along our so-called president, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha, had been living a luxurious life. So he had all the facilities necessary for a common man in our country while the rest of us were suffering. Hi, my name is Subita Tarmakula Segar. I'm currently doing my master's degree in psychology. Uh, I was born in Tamililam and I identify myself as a Tamil. Uh, last time I've been to um, Sri Lanka was in 2019. In that the system that they are continuing for 74 years is depressive of our people, depressive of people's rights, human rights, and they were oppressive towards people. I do not believe a new government will solve the economical crisis at all because what they have left is, is, is a disaster. Like you need to literally take the constitution of Sri Lanka and reform that. You need to like, it's like a house that's fully infected and you're trying to survive in it. You need to destroy the whole foundation and start from the basic, basic, basic. Like a genocide has been committed and no accountability has been done. And the constitution is protecting these people for committing such crimes. Well, more than 152,000 Canadians identify as Sri Lankan, according to the 2016 census. Most live in and around Canada's two largest cities, Toronto and Montreal. Well, if you were a kid in the 1980s, you'll probably be very familiar with these musical puppets. Hmm. Can't you get away? Worries for another day. 
Oh, the memories. Up next, behind the scenes of the reboot of some classic Canadian TV. You gotta break the door down. A strong Canadian showing at the 2022 Emmy Award nominations today. Martin Short is up for Best Comedy Actor for Only Murders in the Building. Sandra Oh for Best Actress in the drama Killing Eve. Seth Rogen for Best Supporting Actor in Pam and Tommy. And late comedy legend Norm Macdonald got three posthumous nods for his last Netflix special, Nothing Special. A comedian is the modern day philosopher, you know? Which, uh, first of all, it always makes me feel sad for the actual modern day philosophers. <laughs> Who exist? Among the most nominated shows, HBO's Succession and South Korean Netflix sensation Squid Game. Now, one Emmy Award winning Canadian kids show has gotten a reboot. The beloved 1980s hit Fraggle Rock is back. And as Eli Glasner showed us earlier this year, the Fraggles aren't the only Canadian critters making a return. Hmm. If you're of a certain generation, you know the show and the song. I feel it deep within my soul. You would make sure that you, you know, crossed everything off your child schedule and you were there to see Fraggle Rock because it just was such a fun, high energy, exciting show. He's being very quiet right now. In 1983, Muppet guru Jim Henson brought viewers to a whole new world with a series shot in Toronto. I got a Fraggle! Original Fraggle cast member David Goals remembers arriving. I just thought, oh my God, here we go. I'm going into the, I'm going into the winter. But had warm memories of the crew. Totally dedicated. They were completely on board with what we were doing. Now there's a new Fraggle series, this time shot inside the Calgary Film Centre. Puppeteer Kira Hall says the scale was like nothing she's ever seen. You can see it in the show, multi-level sets where you're going up and puppeteering on a second level, live water features. We even tried asking one of the Fraggles how it feels to be back, but he couldn't quite grasp the concept. Oh, I don't know about puppets. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about that. It's a whole hobby I've never gotten into. What in blazes is that? And the Fraggles aren't the only Made in Canada critters making a return. That is until Burt Raccoon wakes up. Kevin Gillis dreamt up the family of raccoons who hit the airwaves in 1985. When we first aired on the CBC, we were doing 2 million people a week. Uh, it was as big as Hockey Night in Canada. Story. Now the kids who grew up on the show are clamoring for more. Thankfully, we have wonderful fans all over the, all over the world who aren't ashamed to write things in and, you know, do drawings and do, write songs. Gillis is working on re-releasing the raccoons with remastered music and art and the possibility of new shorts in the future. It seems a mix of Canadian storytelling and nostalgia hits the sweet spot for parents. It's much easier when it's been vetted by your own childhood experience. You know, I know that the Fraggles have a great message and impart uh, a kind of wonderful feeling. I know that the Raccoons is low key a show about climate change. <laughs> Soon kids will get a taste of what their parents devoured decades ago. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Down at Fraggle Rock. <laughs> okay. Up next, uh, we may be witnessing a new record in a sport you may not have heard of. The entire time I felt comfortable. I wanted to go faster. We will show you a world record attempt in joggling in our moment. We'll talk about multitasking. Michael Bergeron has attempted to set the Guinness World Record time for joggling 10 kilometers. Now, uh, joggling is exactly <laughs> what it looks and sounds like, running and juggling. But setting a world record takes speed, it takes endurance, and a ton of concentration. So tonight, the attempt to set that record is our moment. I tried four years ago to get the same record, but it was denied by Guinness. Getting down two minutes is third time. So uh, coming back four years later, stronger, faster, uh, feels really good. The gun went off and started running. So we rented the entire track just for me. So we had professional timers that were present. I had some teammates that were uh, pacers. Yeah, Michael. I had about 70 people in the stand as witness. Uh, so I had everything in my corner. Uh, it took me 34 minutes and 47 seconds. Keep it going. 
Uh, the original record was 36 minutes and 27 seconds. So it was a minute and 40 seconds faster. Yeah, I think seriously, I, I think I could have went faster. The entire time I felt comfortable. I wanted to go faster. Michael Bergeron. I would encourage anyone to try it. it it's, uh, it's harder than what you think it is, but once you do it, it's a great way to get out the outside and uh, you'll get a lot of attention. So it's a great way to engage with your community. Oh, and I believe him that it's harder than a, like he's he's going pretty darn fast. You can you can see him there. Um, the record is not official yet. He, he sent all the video evidence. Guinness has to approve it. I'm sure there are lots of people crossing their fingers. Felicitations, Michael. Pretty incredible accomplishment. That's the national for this July 12th. Have a good night.